you are listening to MSP 1337. I'm your host, Chris Johnson, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank our sponsor, MSP Ignite. MSP Ignite offers a peer group experience that is unique to managed service providers in the technology industry. If you are serious about implementing a model for success through sharing and collaboration of best practices, this is the best way to do it. Head on over to msp-ignite.com to get more information. All right, on to the show. I am letting my guests introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Jeremiah Grossman, CEO of BitDiscovery. Hi, I'm Jeffrey, Jeffrey Smith. Um, I run a company called Cyber Risk Underwriters. Guys, thank you so much for joining us this week as I struggle to even write my own name down on a post-it note. Last week, and actually over the last three weeks, the episodes of MSP 1337 have very much revolved around, I think, an area or a topic that you guys are very familiar with. So we started with uh, a BCDR episode on you know the whole business continuity and you know what happens when bad things happen to your organization that led into the powers out now what same premise but we got a little bit more specific in saying let's not get so hung up on ransomware just because that's what's plaguing the news right now let's just think about the easy things that we're all familiar with you know flooding you know natural disasters those all can pay play wreck havoc on a business. And so we kind of went through that. And then that led us to the gap in the resources to help organizations make those decisions, to have those tabletop exercises and, you know, really be the champions in helping organizations be successful, both in planning and of course, remediation. So in this last episode, uh, I had a chat with Blue Team Con founders. And when we went through the whole conversation, it kind of came to well, what about the cyber insurance? What about those pieces that really help an organization in that recovery mode be successful to get all the way back to, you know, operational? And so I just wanted to tee it off with you guys. Uh, Hiring people is a challenge for any business right now, regardless of what resource category you're hiring for. So thinking about that and the gaps that we have in cybersecurity, cyber insurance, Talk, talk to me a little bit about what you're seeing in the space as businesses, small and large, are looking to uh, get insurance or know that they're insured. And Jeremiah and I were talking about this right before you got on, Jeffrey, is, you know, I have insurance so that when I get ransomed, I can pay for it and keep going, right? And we know that that's not the right approach, but we also know that we have to overcome that sort of mentality. So... I don't know which one of you wants to start. You guys both have two very different approaches to some of the same things. So I'll just say, I'll start with you, Jeremiah, and then, because that's the non-insurance insurance piece, and then we'll go to Jeffrey. So I remember, you know, let's say almost 10 years ago now, I was uh, studying for a Black Hat presentation, and I was reviewing a survey that Black Hat did amongst the, uh, of the attendees. And it asked them, you know, these are, you know, attendees, you know, black hat, these are like heads of security practitioners. It asked the question, do you think your organization is going to get compromised one or more times within the next year? And I think 75 or so percent of everybody said yes. And that was in, this was in context of like, no matter what we do, we're going to get hacked. And I was thinking to myself, well, if that's their point of view, then everybody's just going to start buying insurance because, you know, they're there, they're studying, they're trying hard, but they're going to get hacked anyway. So if there's going to be a loss, might as well insure it. And lo and behold, later, you know, insurance as the category was, you know, the the rocket ship that it, what it was. And of course, you know, amongst the many gripes that you'll hear about insurance, no one likes the insurance industry. Everybody has a love hate relationship with it. But uh, the question becomes, do you, does someone with insurance, is there a moral hazard? If you have insurance, would you behave worse than you would otherwise? Now, I've been hearing these stories for a long time. I've never seen one of them to be true, but this is probably the one I'd like to hear from Jeffrey. Jeffrey, have you ever have you ever heard a business or seen anyone that like really just said, nah, we're insured. We're we're just we're gonna pay the ransom because we're insured? Does, does this actually happen? Um, I haven't seen it happen per se. I think um 
a lot of the the most recent ransomware claims we've incurred in the last um, three or four months, um, they have not paid. The insured has, um, it's, it's up to them whether they pay or not. So a lot of them are, are not paying. Again, it depends on their backup situation, of course. Um, we have one going on now where <clears throat> it, it appears that the, the hackers did get in, they did see the insurance policy. And so they're asking for a ransom to policy limits. And um, they're not paying. <clears throat> they just said we're not paying. So the insurance company is working with them to get their system back. And, you know, the forensics people are in there to figure out what's going on. So they're just going to take it from there. And their hospitality company, I don't know what their downside is. I don't know what sort of business interruption claim or loss of net income claim they're going to be hit with. But it'll all be covered under the policy. So. Um, so, so, so Jeffrey, I, I had wanted to ask this question when you, when you went to, uh, when you took a break, uh, maybe we also take a break now. So the, the question that I have, cause you, you mentioned the not paying and I actually have gone through probably in the last 90 days, I've had four ransomware cases where I've been in part of the recovery or providing guidance to the, the, the company that had been ransomed. And, you know, a lot of things that, you know, I recommend if someone said this to me, like, hey, this just happened. I'm like, have you called your insurance company? Because uh, a lot of insurance companies at this point in time now have some steps in place, like, hey, we need to bring this organization in or, or different resources, forensics, those kind of things that a lot of businesses that haven't done a good job of planning for ransomware, uh, the inevitable to have a plan in place. So in this particular case, and this is why I wanted to ask it's no longer just about being ransomed, right? Or having your data encrypted. Like we all are pretty confident in most cases, like I can recover from backup. The problem now is what did they do with the data that they exfiltrated out of my organization to blackmail me or to use in a way that would be damaging to others, not just myself. And so I think in this particular case, this is the one example I can think of where an insurance company might say, pay the ransom for a couple of reasons. One, they've worked with that type of uh, gang before they've run into them before they know that they're say, quote, their good business ethics, right? Like if they're going to take your money, uh, they don't want to take it twice because that would be bad for business. Eventually no one's going to pay. So I kind of wanted to talk to that a little bit and then kind of keep this going as, as to where we were, where we were at. But what are what are your thoughts on that? Because I think this is a dangerous space to be in. If you think about data that's been exfiltrated, what damage? Does, I mean, imagine if it was like military. Yeah, I mean, um... so what uh, what was the nature of your question? Before? So, so the question was like just kind of leading into you had asked Jeffrey about cases of like paying or not paying. Oh yeah, yeah. My question was like. Are there exceptions? Because I think this gets into helping helping those that would potentially be victims of ransomware think through, like, be careful before you just say, don't pay, or you're not going to pay. Like, I've even had one where I said, I understand you're not going to pay the ransom. You don't need to tell the bad guys that right now. Because we need to buy as much time as we can over the next, say, 48 hours just to make sure and, and literally I, I worked with one client. They're like, well, we're not going to pay. And we're going to tell them right now we're not paying. I'm like, time out because you don't know what they have right now. Jeff, so, that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, what, what I would say is that I, <clears throat> I don't get involved in the negotiations with sure. claims. You know, I, I, I'm an advocate for my insureds. So if the claim, you know, isn't going the right way or there's some issues, then I will get involved. Um, I, I will say what the carriers uh, do well is, you know, it's a business decision. So they need information like calculate, like I said earlier, calculate the, t uh, the typical what expected net income loss if they have to shut down or they lose a chunk of business. Sure. They have to decide, you know, I mean, here to forward, the records haven't been worth very much because people can't prove they've been damaged. Right. So from my experience, you know, early on, they were saying, oh, your exposure is a hundred or three hundred dollars times every record you have. And that was a bunch of bullshit. Um, is this rated 
MA seventeen or is it yeah, 17? I think something something like that. I, I'm, we're 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 okay. I think okay. if you were to just repeatedly say that over and over again, it might get flagged. <laughs> so um, so but that's that, that's really not it because we don't see. I don't know ninety percent of the claims we see are first party claims. Mm-hmm. So they're not lawsuits. They're not they're not third party claims. So okay, you know, every now and then you'll 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 run into one where there's been a class that's been certified. Um, but again, it's very difficult to prove that an individual has actually incurred injury, you know, whether right. they, certainly not bodily injury, but like um, personal injury, you know, from the release, you know, record. So we just don't see that very much. Um, what the insurance company's job is, is to give the insured enough information to make their own decision, whether right. they pay or not. Um, so, so along those lines, let's talk about um, insurance claims for a minute. So, mm-hmm. you know, I've, I've worked with several organizations where there's a mindset that because I have insurance, you know, that I have coverage to get reimbursement and, and hopefully that's the case, right? Like you hope you get reimbursed with something so that it's not a, you, know, you pay for insurance for a reason. Um, but what was interesting, like in this particular case, uh, they had, I think roughly, I think it was $300,000 in, in, in loss. Um, Mm -hmm. about a hundred thousand plus of that was tied to hard costs. And then the rest of that was really tied more to loss of opportunity while they were in that recovery mode, Mm -hmm. um, those types of things. So obviously not all of that is, you know, can be tied to a a quantifying, like get this back. Right. Um, but Mm -hmm. what was surprising to them was that the reimbursement really only ended up being about 25, 30% of what their real hard losses were. And they were just kind of surprised. And so one of my suggestions was, and obviously he's kind of gone through this too, is like, you need to put more scrutiny into the insurance policy that you're buying. And I think a lot of people, they're like, I got cyber insurance or I've got specific insurance. And I think a lot of people don't read all of the pieces of the policy to understand what is and isn't covered based on the type of event and what's excluded. Mm -hmm. Actually, let me jump well, in on that one. Yeah, please. First is uh, when you say most don't or we, we don't know what's in the policy, it's like that's important to distinguish. Like, who's the we? You know, business insurance is generally almost exclusively bought by the CFO and the CEO of the organization. With rare exception, maybe this is changing. The CISOs and the security teams almost never read the policy, never exposed to the quotes, never exposed to the coverage. They have no idea what's in there, even though it impacts them greatly. So if they know what's covered and what's not covered, that's actually a more mature, advanced organization, You know, at least from the security department's perspective, because in my experience, no one has ever read the security policy. Yeah. So I, I will, I'll add some clarification. So most of the audience that will be listening to this, they're by and large, smaller IT service providers that are helping the SMB space that they're coaching in some of these areas. And so this happened to be an IT service provider that was about 25 employees, so not large. And mm-hmm. I think what was really the issue wasn't so much not understanding the policy coverage per se. It was more of like when you get into ransomware or you get into that cybersecurity coverage, I think there's ambiguity to a degree when it comes to the difference between that and say general liability coverage or errors and emissions, because those are a little bit like when we say that acts of terrorism are not included in your policy, people are like, got it. But now you're getting a cybersecurity insurance and by and large, this type of act is a terrorist or could be construed as a terrorist act, especially when it's a, you know, th- the threat actors are not on U.S. soil, those types of things. And the way we seem to be wanting to treat this now at the government level. I don't, I, I, uh, I think there's been some cases that were mistaken where insurance claims are denied because it was a nation state or terrorism. Mm-hmm. I think there's all been resounding debunked because of the story, what the stories got wrong was that the, the insured, the companies that was hacked, they were trying to make a cyber insurance claim on a property on a property insurance policy or business insurance policy, not a cyber policy. Gotcha. I don't know if I know of a single case where a claim was denied on the on a cyber insurance policy on the grounds of terrorism or you know or anything like that. I don't I don't think that's happened yet. Okay. 
I'm, I'm, I'm actually just looking at this through the lens of like questions that are getting asked about cyber insurance. I'll give you an example. I have, I have a scenario right now where we just went through it with this company. They didn't have cyber insurance. They didn't even understand what that meant, but they had, you know, property insurance and all the other kinds of insurance. In fact, they were real, the really big carrier, um, but didn't really, uh, had, hadn't really wrapped their heads around that need for cyber insurance. I think now, you know, I think cyber insurance is a no brainer. Sure. Buy some, buy anything. Right. Um, it's because look, like they'll, you'll see articles that now today, because of all the breaches, because of all the ransomware, cyber insurance is raised by two or three times mm-hmm. or something like that. Right. Raised by right. 50%. But they leave out the actual price of it. I think these days the price of cyber insurance is two to 3% of the liability limit. So if you're getting a million dollar policy, you know, Jeffrey, correct me if I'm wrong here, but expect to pay somewhere between 20 and 30,000 a year, maybe as high as 40, you know, that was in the old days, baby. <clears throat> what do you, what is it now? What it's, what's the, what's the well, risk? I mean, you know, um, first I can, I can speak to the issue of, you know, what the insurance does not, does not cover. And, and Jeremiah's spot on Mondelay and Kip Chang's and uh, several banks, you know, made headlines because uh, they had, you know, they got denied coverage and in each instance, not a single one of them had a cyber insurance policy and and all the loss costs that you mentioned, Chris, earlier, they would all be covered under a a cyber policy. Gotcha. So so they may, may, they may have tried to recover under like a general liability policy that had a little endorsement that said, Hey, here's a quarter million dollars worth of cyber. It only covers incident response and uh, maybe forensic notification. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, what, what's, what's the, what's the general ratio of like a million dollar policy, Jeffrey, what's the, what's the, what's the premium range now? It's really hard to say. Um, you know, it used to be, you know, the market's kind of crazy right now, you know, even a year ago, um, we'd put out a quote and the, the insured would say, man, this is a great quote. You know, it's, it's real cheap and I'll just stroke you a check. And now they're saying, you know, holy cow. Um, do you, do you, do you guys have premium financing available? You know, I mean, so we've had huh. uh, policies go from, you know, five thousand to thirty thousand. Uh, um, we've had policies go from. Usually, the smaller policies are increasing by at least fifty percent, if not doubling. Yeah, but what's what's like that? That's what I mean. Like, mm-hmm. like that, I like to get the actual dollar figures. If I like, I want a basic, mm-hmm. average million dollar policy. Am I paying twenty thousand a year? Or am I paying fifty? Well, it depends on the size of your company. If you're if you're a two million dollar. Um, you know, if you're a $2 million manufacturing company, you're probably going to pay, you know, 2%, you know, or, or 1%. If you're, uh, you know, a $20 million healthcare provider with, um, um, you know, I don't know, let's say it's 100 employees, 200 employees, that first million could cost you $20,000. Okay, so, so, so these numbers here, these five-figure numbers, mm-hmm. you know, they sound like a lot, but... Let's just say I, this is why I advocate for everybody to buy insurance because you have your InfoSec budget, you're going to spend something. If you're looking to figure out what to spend with your last 20, 30, 50 grand, mm-hmm. what does 20,000 buy you in InfoSec? Mm-hmm. What does 50,000 buy you? It's effectively mm-hmm. nothing. You know, our, our, our space is expensive. So it's a balance between one more security control that might prevent a breach, maybe versus one that will pay off in the event of breach. If it's like the last line item on this overall security spend and protection of the organization, just buy insurance. One more security control isn't going to really help you. Well, you bring up a really good point with that statement. You're talking about that risk and, you know, probability of it happening versus the, you know, impact to business and I think that's that first question that I think a lot of organizations need to ask is, to your point, one more security control. Well, hypothetically speaking, if that security control is going to dramatically change, you know, the, you know, the probability of it happening, well, that's one thing. But I think to your point, we all know that bad things are going to happen. You still have to have the insurance period how big your premium is or how much you want to, or like, what's the maximum I can buy. Now that, that'd be the flip side of that same coin. I, I, think I, was, what, looking, I was looking at it because the prices of cyber insurance are going way up. I was like, yeah, because they're awfully cheap and they're still cheap, <laughs> like relative <laughs> to what InfoSec costs. Like InfoSec is expensive. Like, 
I mean, there's, there's, there's like, there's this term in InfoSec called the InfoSec poverty, poverty line, where stuff's so expensive that people below that line just can't buy anything of what we do. Sure. That's very problematic. Well, you know, Jeremiah, when we were, you know, a, a couple, even, even today, I guess there, are, you know, some of the InfoSec people push back on cyber insurance because they say, Hey, if you know, if you, if you get that, you're not going to use us. And, you know, now if you don't uh, have some, semblance of a, you know, of a, of a security <clears throat> program, you're not going to get the insurance. Yep. It's gone from, you know, an application that says, uh, you know, five questions, three of which are your address and your website. Um, now, if, if they're either getting scanned, they're either getting bone scanned um, or you're having to fill out ransomware supplements and everything. And, and probably half the market that we half the markets we deal with, uh, if you don't have MFA, you're not, you don't qualify. So that's a, a, that's a profound statement. Yeah. Did, yeah. So it, now it, you have to have yeah. it to get the insurance before. Remember we were talking at black hat saying, you know, people ask me that they'd say, you know, well, we just think people stop by. And I said, no, the right thing to do is the insurance is the last piece of the puzzle. You know, you do everything you can do before you have a, a loss. You figure out what your exposure is. You, you do everything you can do to prevent a loss from happening. And the last thing you do is buy insurance. Now what's happening and people were maybe skipping those steps. Now they can't skip those steps. Right. So, so this is a good segue, uh, Jeremiah. I'll give you. A, I'll give you a, in just a second. The segue sure. that I want to do is the questionnaire. This is like, I mean, I get this all the time, and I'll give you this example, and then we'll come back to to uh, my question after. I know Jeremiah's got something, but if I don't get this out, like my post-it notes are like, I'm they're just full. <laughs> so the question is, most of these questionnaires are not the ability for you to fill in a, write an essay, right? The question is something along the lines of is 2FA implemented and I won't go into all of the granularities, but it's like a yes or no statement, right? It's not a yes, but, or a, you know, and, and so some of the questions I've seen have gotten so granular though, that they're getting into things like uh, across all switches, routers, firewalls, and the list just keeps going on and on. You're like, well, 75% of those devices Today, it's physically possible to do exactly what's being called out in this question, but the other 25%, it's not physically possible. So as someone who's providing guidance, I can go, hey, wait a second. If I were to create 2FA through a VPN, and the only way to get to those devices is with that VPN, could I then answer yes? Because in, in the intent, I've satisfied the question. In the way the question is written, I cannot. So ponder on that. Jeremiah, you wanted to say something before I just like jumped ahead. Oh, no, we'll just go right into that one. I think, well, one, what's the questionnaire for? And I think there's for two reasons. One is so the insurer can model risk and give you the appropriate price. Um, another reason is, is that when a breach, so most of the questions that the customer is asking won't really modify their premiums at all. There's only going to be like five maybe questions that are going to modify the premiums out of the hundred that you might ask. The rest is for actuarials at the end. So when a claim occurs, they can look back at your questionnaire and the claims of hundreds of others to try to figure out what works and what doesn't work. What the carriers really don't want, and they might sting you on later, is if you lie. Whatever you do, don't lie on those questionnaires because they'll say, we wouldn't have covered you or would have charged you more if you had answered this honestly, you know, because they're going to do an investigation uh, in the event of a major breach. Sure. Uh, but I think, you know, in these questionnaires, they're going to have errors. They're not going to be perfect. They're written by humans and still, you know, you know, our, the questionnaires written by InfoSec are going to be riddled with problems. That's where it's going to be important for you to work with your broker and the broker work with the carrier to try to figure out what the carrier, what information the carrier really wants. And then you just sort it out. Like you just, you don't have to guess or lie, you know, it's just like ask for clarification. Just tell them the situation. They'll probably be happy to get back to you. Okay. And I, and I think that's uh, a large part of it is not truly understanding the intent of questions. So you've clarified, I think that's pretty good to say like the, the two really big reasons. And I think that's helpful. The, the one thing that comes to mind for me though, is just thinking about recent events and vendors in this space. So like, for example, if you're a Kaseya shop, it literally has a question that says, uh, please name your RMM tool. And then the next one after that is like, is it in the cloud or is it on premises? Right? Like those are pretty two very specific intentional questions.
questions to your point of like whether or not that does or doesn't imp- impact my premium. But then there's that sting part that there is a claim. They're like, oh, these guys had fill in the blank and it was on prem. So, you know, jump to conclusions, right? And I think there's some nervousness around answering these questions from those carriers because it's not all of them yet. It's a lot of them though, quickly. Well, it, it, there, at some point, I think hopefully um, there'll be a, some standardized questionnaire. So one questionnaire will satisfy many different carriers. But if sure. you get rejected by one, I mean, what is there like, you know, 20, 40, 50 carriers out there, you know, so you're going to get covered by someone out there. It just, you know, that's where your broker helps you out by helping you through uh, the questionnaires, which it can get fairly exhausting. Got it. You want to add anything to that, Jeffrey? Because I, I mean, I think the questions are really a big deal right now. People are suddenly going, I got this questionnaire put in front of me. Or the other one, this is a little bit uh, sort of a part two of the question is my client has a questionnaire that they've brought to me to help them fill it out, providing that I'm providing that info sec to them as a, because they don't have those internal resources. And all of a sudden they're going, Hey, can you answer these questions for me? Yeah, that's a lot. A lot of them have to go to an IT internal or external IT person. I will tell you, and it's not personal, but a lot of the markets don't like <clears throat> MSSPs. And they just don't, they don't like them because of the, you know, the downstream risk. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, they, uh, the one the breach of an MSSP risk, so impacts a thousand other companies. Yeah. They, right. they don't like it, you know, and, and so like, you know, the two big issues now, all the, they all ask the question about solar winds. Mm-hmm. You know, did you use them? Have you already filed a claim? And then they'll laser it out. Um, uh, Microsoft Exchange, you know, the servers, big sure. issue. Yep. Um, if they have them, we can, you know, we can help them remediate those, but the level of sophistication varies, you know, if they're using, and a lot of them now ask, do you use an outside company? If so, who are they? Got and it. they'll underwrite that company. Again, it depends on the, the size of the account, the level of sophistication of the buyer and, you know, what's the real exposure. So, you know, there, there's a lot more questions asked. They, they know a lot more. They right. know um, a lot more. Of the, they know more about the vectors. And so, you know, the insurer, the insurance companies. So before, as I mentioned, you know, you could get a quote with a base five or six question. Mm-hmm. You know, right. you yep. encrypt, you know, tell us a little bit about uh, the data you hold. Um, <clears throat> there's a question about does a second person confirm wiring instructions um, and then and then back up, do back up. Yeah. Um, and, and now the, if you're over, you know, I'd say 15 million in revenue or you're in certain um, uh, specific classes, you have to fill out like a ransomware supplement. Okay. And so that goes into a lot more detail about, you know, business interruption planning and, you know, these sort of things. And so that, that comes more into play. Um, now Basically you have looking for evidence. some markets. Yeah, exactly. And, and then there's some markets um, who, um, have who pulled out and and reassess their pricing strategy and now they're back in and you know I've got one market if if you're super clean risk and they like you based upon you filling out you know multiple page app with a lot of questions on it um, they'll write you at half what the other markets will write you if they like you that's all they're going to write and and if you if you check all the right boxes they're going to be really really competitive. Um, so a lot of times it can just benefit you by answering those questions. Gotcha. But the, the market, it, it, you know, it's a big shakeout right now um, in terms of, you know, who's going to continue to play and who isn't. You've got markets uh, coming back and telling me three weeks ago, they were writing a bunch of lawyers for me. And then they come back uh, yesterday and sent me a note saying, hey, we're, you know, we're, we're calling our book of lawyers. We're getting too many claims. Um, so it, it's very dynamic. And, and, what seems to be the, the markets that seem to be doing really well, at least in the SMB space, are the ones that, you know, have, you know, the more insured techs, you know, like the coalitions, like the at bays, like the to, like Corvus, that actually they price based upon vulnerability scans. And so what you've seen is those guys started doing it, you know, as part of their original business model when they when they <clears throat> when they started up. Now you're starting to see the Lloyd's market 
markets and 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 some of the other domestic markets start to in you know start to do the volume scans and say here's our quote but it's based upon you know it's contingent upon us getting this outside scan that we should get back in three days so okay. either they're doing it during the underwriting process um at, and and it goes into a portal and it spits it out right away or they're going to an outside party and and getting a volume scan and if it looks good they'll put a number out for you so Jeffrey brings up a really good point. I don't think questionnaires will go away, you know, entirely, but I think their value will be diminished over time. Well, they'll see a few. And I think what the insurance companies will do, just like some of the others that he mentioned, are going to gravitate towards ongoing monitoring of their of their clientele. They're just going to scan you and review you all the time and you know, send you warnings. Hey, you have open RDP here. Right. You know, to really close that up. So because the the questionnaires, they're they're not going to have the greatest answers, not the greatest clarity, and anything you answer could change in the next hour. So just right. monitor everything. So, so along That's those lines, Jeremiah, I, I got just today. I got uh, a notice that six of our accounts have uh, security issues that were picked up, you know, in the twenty four seven monitoring. And so what we do is we we take that information, we go back to our agents and to the insurance and say, hey, look, here's what you have. If you need help fixing it, call us. And and so it's it's. It's happened a lot. I probably get four or five a week um, of, you know, something they picked up, a vulnerability they picked up along the way and said, here's something you need to do to make you and us, you and <clears throat> uh, you guys safer. So, so along those lines, it's kind of interesting when you think about it. If I think back to the point of sale space and PCI compliance, you know, the scanning has been happening for a long time, right? Like if I want to get uh, PCI compliant with my, uh, you know, credit card processor, I'm doing some sort of a trust wave or some of these other products where they come in and, and I got to be able to prove that whatever findings that were there that need to be remediated before I can get that clean, uh, get the lower print or lower rates on my, my transactions, those kind of things. To your, to your point earlier about MSSP or MSP that are providing these third-party outsourced IT services, security services, um, it's it's a no brainer, right? Like the the amount of risk that that an MSP or MSSP is taking on is is multiplied by the number of clients that they have, regardless of what vertical they're in, right? Like it's still how many entities do I have, you know, tentacles into that could easily be what undermines me too, or similarly in in reverse, uh, all of those businesses that I'm providing these services to, if they have an issue. <laughs> was I the reason for it? Right. And so, so to your, to what you said, you know, talk to me a little bit about, so you're saying they're not liking it, but are you seeing then that when, so like, I see a lot of like these businesses coming to the third party to help with these answers. Right. So as we're answering them, is that an opportunity for the MSP, MSSP to just say, Hey, can I talk to the, the broker that you're working with? Because the reality is we want the same things, right? The broker and the MSP are kind of on the same team almost because that client being secure is its reputation. It's all kinds of stuff for me if I fail. Um, there, there are a couple of dynamics there. Um, you know, sometimes the, the, uh, there can be a matching of the wits sometimes. So, and, and sometimes one side's right. Sometimes the other side's right. Sure. So, um, but more often than not, we find that the markets that are really doing the right thing and doing the bone scans and stuff, that they, they, um, they really know what they're doing. And we've actually educated, I think, more. Because I, I guess, you know, the ones who have the MSSPs are likely to have the better security people. A lot of the ones that use MSPs, they may sell security products. But in my experience, a lot of them don't have, Correct. Um, you know, hardcore security people. Um, but, sure. you know, there's, there's, there's a sensitivity you know, to the MSSPs uh, and, and the MSPs, but um, we, we get them on the phone a lot. It's more lately because there's so much more scrutiny on these, sure. you know, on these risks as they come in. I, I just figure if it's an MSSP, like when the, mar I think at the, I, I wouldn't be surprised as the mar MSSP market evolves, they're just the ones offering insurance to their clientele, whether it's warranties or insurance, they should be. I mean, if they're responsible yeah. for it, they should be offering to their clientele. I'm seeing more and more of that now. It, like I would say within the last 12 months, it's gone from maybe one in five that I've worked with that was, we would say like, oh, well, we, we've got our own solution that we're selling our clients to today. It's like 
they're at least got three people that they're recommending for them to talk to if they're not offering it themselves. Uh, and I think yeah. that, and I think I've been working on it for a long time, but I think that should go for all security vendors. If you're trying to protect your customer, you want to make sure your financial interests are in lockstep with theirs. For most of the security industry, it isn't, at least not yet, but it will be. So to recap or summarize here, I think I heard three really big things. One is why, while we may be getting questionnaires, the next big thing sort of is going to be the, the vulnerability assessment or the continuous vulnerability assessment, kind of like what we saw with PCI. The second one is um, cyber insurance is not the same, <laughs> obviously, as your, your property insurance. But more importantly, it's it if you have the premium, the appropriate premium that you've worked out with your broker, that is the coverage that you should be getting, right? Like this isn't like just like, roll the dice. And then the third one, I think even maybe just as big as those first two to Jeremiah's point is before you just start buying insurance, looking at the risk and probability, because while insurance is relatively inexpensive to a degree based on say your, your revenue stream, know what that looks like, because it's kind of a no brainer to get insurance unless the amount of money you're going to spend on insurance far outweighs the impact of that, that potential breach. Um, guys, is there anything else that we should leave the audience before I let you guys go? I'll let you go first on that one, Jeffrey. Um, I, th- I think um, one, you know, just understand that the market is undergoing a big shakeout. And so a lot of the markets who were doing this stuff in the past and actually built big books of business are starting to cull their books. So the market's getting really tight and they're going to ask more questions and, you know, the underwriter is a lot more educated too, you know, and a lot of these, as I mentioned earlier, a lot, most of the markets that, that are, are really doing well are the ones that are using the vulnerability assessments as a big part of the underwriting process. Gotcha. I'll take the, uh, the practitioner perspective. Um, I, where the InfoSec teams and the InfoSec group see so on down get stung is they didn't read the policy, especially the part in the event of breach, Audis, uh, the insurer will want to use their own incident response team, their go-to, and not something internal or not the one that the InfoSec team wants to use. So read the policy and to figure out what the process is in the event of breach and claim, and that'll solve a lot of double payment issues. Well, I guess uh, along those lines too, Jeremiah, that also gets into, you know, I can recover really fast if I can wipe the hardware and reload data, right? But if forensics is going to come in and says, you can't change any of that until we finish the investigation, that can really cause some problems. Exactly right. Exactly right. So read the policies, right? Read, read, <laughs> gotta know read, it, gotta read it. And see where it complements, because it might also complement your security program. It's the insurance carrier said, do this, therefore we will do that. But the other one is where it conflicts. You've got to know those. Yep. All right, guys, I really appreciate I think it. Just um, real quick. Yeah, one, go ahead. one thing to keep in mind is, yep. is that anybody who buys this stuff should require their broker to sit with them and explain the entire policy in terms they understand. That's, that's what they're paid for. I like it. If you don't understand it, it's probably not going to work well. <laughs> right. All right, guys. Um, thanks so much for being on for everybody listening. Uh, thanks and have a great week. Thanks a lot, Chris.